take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter number 15. The book of Acts chapter number 15 is where we're going to eventually get to today. Um, I am uh, felt led not to uh, visit the stories of Paul's first missionary journey that's recorded in chapters 13 and 14. And I don't want you to misconstrue that as me believing it's unimportant. Instead, I, I just I, I, I felt drawn to go ahead and move to chapter 15. But I want to encourage you to take the time to read through the first missionary journey. Uh, Paul and Barnabas were singled out by the Holy Spirit as, as, as really the first missionaries. And they struck out and did something that no one really had ever done before. And they traveled somewhere over 1,200 miles by boat, by foot. Uh, They visited a number of different cities. And in that time, there were miracles that took place. There were people who were saved as they proclaimed the gospel. Um, Paul and Barnabas got mistook for Greek gods once. Uh, They thought Barnabas was Zeus and that Paul was Hermes. Uh, Hermes was the spokesman for the gods, and so he must have talked a lot. And they actually brought out cattle to sacrifice to these two men. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how it ends. They stoned Paul as well. Paul got stoned. I'm not going to tell you how that ends either. Um, You'll you'll have have to go read them. And they're great stories, but they bring out... This, this underlying truth that the, the gospel was supposed to go to the ends of earth, the earth. That was the mandate that Jesus left the church with, and it's still the mandate that we have today. And even though it's much more common for us to send out missionaries and for us to uh, go with them by our support, uh, it's, it was, this, was, this was fresh, it was new. And it's great narrative, so... I want to encourage you to take the time to read through it for yourself. But while they were traveling, they eventually ended up right back where they started. They made this path, and then they backtracked to visit all the cities and churches that they had ministered to and in. And they came back to Antioch, which seems to be their home base. And from there, you have this event that happens in Acts chapter number 15. Now, Acts 15 has been, has come to be known as the Jerusalem Council. And it's of utmost importance to all us Gentiles in the room because it made some real significant provisions for us, but it also shaped the entire future of the church. Now, I want us to read through this together and recognizing how important this is that it brought pretty much the whole of the church back to Jerusalem. And, and it's, well, it's just filled with interesting detail. So I'm going to walk through it, probably through the first 21 verses, and give you some running commentary before I bring us to what I believe is the main point of the passage, one that I want you to walk away with today. So beginning in Acts chapter number 15 and verse number 1. But some men came down from Judea, and they were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, these guys are going to be refuted. Let me go ahead and say that up front. But... I want to be careful in my description, my talking about them, to not be too unkind to their desire to add something to the gospel. Because I believe all of us in one way or another, especially if you're getting a little long in the tooth, and I consider myself in that bunch now, and so um, it's very easy for any of us to lay down our traditions. I think that for some of us, it's harder than others. But when you think about what this tradition that 
was true in the law of Moses to circumcise a child on the eighth day, that was more than just a, a side note in their religious expression. That was intended to be the mark that marked them as God's people. That was the mark of the covenant. And so it was no small thing. And when the church came along and people began to preach that it's Jesus plus nothing, basically, then they saw their traditions begin to be treated as unimportant, even to be despised in some senses. And it was a big deal for them. And I don't, I don't want to dismiss the struggle because I think any one of us might have those things that we love or have loved about church and we don't want them changed and we didn't want them changed. It was a big deal for some of you when we stopped singing out of hymnals. Don't confess, I know. <laughs> Might have wanted to leave the church over it. If that hymnal was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it was good enough for me. There are some folks that are really still, you know, they, they can't get past that, that the use of the King James Version of the Bible is not as common anymore. I don't read out of the King James Version of the Bible, not even in my private study. I don't because I don't speak Elizabethan English. I barely understand modern English. And I know I don't speak it all that well, but at, at the same time, that was incredible for its day. But we have better, what I believe are more trustworthy translations that are available to us today. That's why I read out of the ESV. It's not because they, you know, I didn't buy it on sale. I'm really proud of the ESV. You got to pay more money for it. But I think it's the best, most accurate, most readable translation. But some of you are like, no, nah, we need to bring back the King James, these and thous and thoughts and all these things. Here's, maybe you have this struggle as well. I have my Bible memorized in a hodgepodge of translations. When I was a kid, I memorized it in the King James Version, and then I got the NIV, which I don't recommend anymore, but it was what was available at the time, so I moved on, and I'm like, wow, and I've got things memorized in the NIV, and then I went through a New American Standard uh, season, a New Revised Standard season, and I finally ended up at the ESV, and now... <laughs> The Bible verses that I have memorized are just a hodgepodge of translations. Thank God for Google. You can put a few words in and it'll tell you where it's at because I, I, I have them jumbled. But hear me, it's one thing to have fond memories of something. It's another thing to declare it to be necessary. There are those that grieve the fact that people don't, that everybody doesn't feel the need to dress up in what I grew up being called my Sunday best. That means that every Sunday I had on a, I had on the fanciest clothes that I had, a coat, a tie, and, and uh, ties are medieval torture devices invented by, well, I have, I have a theory there. I'm going to keep it to myself. <laughs> And uh, I have this thing known as the field's chin. It is an incredibly dominant trait. All of my children have it. It's this thing that dangles here more and more as I get older. And, um, and when I have a tight neck on, it looks like bread that's done in the oven. <laughs> Rolling over the sides of the pan. But I know that some of you lament and you say, I cannot believe people don't dress up. You may lament that we don't do midweek services anymore, that we started doing small groups years ago instead. And you, you, you may even think that these things were good and need to come back. But the danger lies when any of us take these things that are not central and necessary to the message of the gospel and start putting them on par as just as important as the gospel. These traditions, for good or bad, 
really are more about personal preference than theology. And when you're a part of a community, that means that, that, that you're, when, you're, when you come together in community, your I takes a back seat to be a part of the larger us. And that means that how you worship on Sunday is going to look different when you're in the us than it does when you're just the I. How we pray when we get together in a group looks different than it does when we just pray by ourselves. Being a part of the us means that we accept some of the flavor of the community that we're with. And so that means that there, and hear me when I say this, I pray you can. You might be able to find some church out there that has more things about your, you know, that you like, but until you become the grand potentate of a church, it will never look just exactly like you think it ought to look. The question to ask is not, do I like everything about the church? The question to ask is, are they preaching the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ? And I know you can shop and choose and pick places that might be a little more to your liking. That's fine. But at the same time, recognize the perfect church isn't out there. When we come together, it's always going to look a little bit different when it's us rather than when it's just I. The problem in this instance, though, is this was more than personal preference. They were making a theological demand. They were making a demand to put strings on salvation. They were demanding a gospel that says you need Jesus plus circumcision. And hear me, that was just the first step in their agenda. And don't get me wrong, there was going to be pain involved for a Gentile who heard about this. You're talking about a stumbling block to the faith. For a Jew, that happened to them most likely on the eighth day, back before God gave them memory. It seems obvious this would be a stumbling block for the Jews, but even more importantly... The issue is not the stumbling block that it created, but rather that they were adding something to the message of the gospel. And when you add something to the gospel, it's more than just creating another gospel. I believe what is more accurate is that when you add something to the gospel, it ceases being the gospel at all. And so, there was a fight. In verse 2, after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, that's, that's Luke being nice and saying small, no small dissension. They got into a fight publicly, debated about it. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Skip down to verse 5. But some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees Remember, that's one of those um, Jewish religious groups, a powerful group. They rose up and said, it's necessary to circumcise them, listen, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. See, I said earlier that the circumcision thing was just the first step, that eventually everything was going to get added to it as well. What they were really saying is that keeping the whole law was necessary for salvation. And it took more than repenting and believing. It took more than just what Jesus did. It also took your ability to keep the rules. Now, they were being overt when they said this. They were being overt about it. So many people, and my mental struggle is when I'm covert about it, when it happens suddenly in my mind. If there is anything in your head that you think improves, increases, warrants your standing with God, you're adding something to the gospel. You say, well, I got saved, I repented, I believed, and I read my Bible every day. You say, well, that's a good thing, right? It's a wonderful thing until you start thinking that it earns you something with God. 
I repented and I believed and I go to church every Sunday, bless God. Not a bad thing, a great thing actually, but the moment you start thinking that you're a little better than somebody else that only goes every other week, based totally on that alone, what you're doing inadvertently, covertly, is adding something to the gospel. Do you really think anything you could do, which Paul described all these good works that he could do as filthy rags. He said, all my righteousness is as filthy rags. And that term is incredibly graphic, by the way, and I'm not going to describe it in full right now. But it's really, really graphic and gross. He's saying, my righteous, the things that I do are filthy rags. I am saved not because of the stuff I add. I can't add anything that has value. I am saved 100%, totally, completely, because of what God did for me through Jesus Christ. But it's so easy for us to sneak in to another mindset. When you start adding things to the gospel, I pray you can hear me, there'll be no end to it. Today it's just the gospel plus this one thing. Just like for them, it was the gospel plus circumcision. But hear me, there'll be no end. Before long, it'll be the gospel plus this and everything else. Verse 6, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. Now, it's hard to discern the exact timeline of when this council happened. But what I believe, and I've got some agreement with me among, among scholars, is that this council happened after the episode that we looked at in Galatians where Paul felt like he had to rebuke Peter publicly because Peter was eating with the Gentiles. Remember, that was, that was the stir up when he went to Cornelius' house that he spent some time there, actually went into his house. He was a Gentile, and this Jew went in and apparently ate something with him. And that was hard against the traditions of these Jews. And so Peter didn't completely get delivered from it initially, and he wound up eating with Gentiles, but then these Jews came around, and he tried to save face with them, and he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. And Paul rebuked him openly in front of God and everybody because what he was doing was in front of God and everybody. And Paul's ministry to these Gentiles was on the line if he didn't say something. And so Peter had a huge fail. But that's Peter, right? You know, I mean, just dynamite and debris. That's who Peter is. And so he had this moment where he ushered in the church for the Gentiles. And then he like really missed it over here. And here in this moment, I think it's after that Galatians event. And I think that there's something in this dude that says, I am going to get this right here. And so, as soon as the issue is brought up, he is the first one who jumps up. Continuing in verse 7, it says, He said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them. Hear me, no distinction. They're just as much a part of the family of God as we are. There is no special case for the Jewish person anymore. There is only the church. There are only those who follow Jesus. There is no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? It's a great confession. Peter's looking at them and saying, so you're telling them that that's necessary for salvation when not one of us have been able to do it? When nobody's been able 
If anything, what the law did was reveal to all of us that there was sin there and usher us into grace. What makes the gospel such great news is that the awareness of sin and the recognition that we can do absolutely nothing to live up to the standard that God sets. When you hear the good news that God did it all for you through Christ, that's what makes it really good. The bad news is what makes the good news so good. And he's saying, we couldn't live up to it. Now, you're going to try and make them bear it? Verse 11, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the saints, all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James replied. Now, the reason James is singled out here, this is James, the brother of Jesus. And one of the reasons that he's probably singled out here is because I think he became the leader of the Jerusalem church. And and after they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. Simeon, that's another way of saying Simon, which is one of the names for Peter. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take him, to take from them a people for his name. Now, uh, I'll admit that this is, this, is, this is subtle, and you'd be hard-pressed to find this just from reading it in the English, but that word there, people, is a very special word to a Jewish believer because that word people, laos, was a word that they generally used only to describe the covenant family of Israel. And so when they used Laos, uh, people for his name, almost solely they would use it to describe other Israelites because they were God's people. But right here, James is making a huge statement by using this word to not just describe Israelites, but to describe everyone who comes to faith in Christ. He's saying, listen, there is no distinction. They are the people of God just like we are the people of God. And with his words, verse 15, And with this, the words of the prophet agree, just as it written. He's quoting Amos and Jeremiah here. After this, I'll return and I'll rebuild the tent of David that's fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I'll restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. What what Jesus was rebuilding from David is not just for one particular group of Israelites, it's for the Gentiles as well that they might all be restored. Therefore, my judgment, verse 19, well, look at verse 17, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from that which has been strangled, and from blood. And from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he's read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Now, you first look at this, remember the issue was, do you need to have somebody obey all of the law to plus Jesus to actually be saved. And it started off with the argument of Jesus plus circumcision. It became Jesus plus all of the law. And, you know, from the tenor of the text, didn't you expect James to come in there at the end and say, it's Jesus plus nothing. It's Jesus plus absolutely nothing. No law, no rule. Just Jesus, faith in him, belief in what he did. That's all that's necessary. But that's not exactly what James said. 
He said the Gentiles are not going to be required to keep the law, yes, and that does include circumcision, thank God. But they do have to obey two additional rules. He said that, and, and, and you read it, it's almost like, is he speaking out both sides of his mouth? He's like, You're not, we're not going to put any trouble on the Gentiles. We're not going to require them to do anything, but they need to do this. He may seem to be speaking out both sides of his mouth, but I don't think that's what's happening here. I think James is saying, since we're not going to burden the Gentiles with obedience to the law and therefore come in line with the gospel and make it as easy as it should be for them to come into the church, I think he's saying we should afford Jewish brothers some of the same courtesy so that when they come into the church, they won't be offended, just like a Gentile might be offended at the idea of circumcision. We're going to make it to where these Jews can come in, and they won't be offended by many of the things that they see or have to put up with. And it's two of them, sexual immorality and meat offered to idols. I want to talk about these two things separately. The first, sexual immorality was incredibly common among Gentiles in this day. I, I think that it would, I don't know if it was more prevalent than it is in our day, but oh my goodness, sexual revolution has just, I mean, honestly, we're at a place where there are few ethics, there are few priorities that are higher than, than sexual liberty. It's beginning to trump religious liberty in our country, and, and, and it is so common that, that it is, it's honestly the expectation that there is going to be a promiscuity that exists in our culture, and it's become even so that it will exist within the church. Now, now, in those days, the Gentiles, they didn't embrace sex outside of marriage as sin. In fact, it was a part of temple worship for many of their gods. And so for them, it was just, there's no rules, much like there aren't many rules today. I mean, honestly, I think by and large, we still look at it and we say, you know, children, no, bad. But in everything else, all you really need is consent. Two consenting adults, whenever, wherever, however, it's all good. It's the culture that we see around us today. But to be clear, within the canon of Scripture, within the revelation of Scripture, it is so clear that any expression other than one man and one woman in the context of one marriage, every other sexual expression that exists in our culture now or in their culture then is a sin before God. Now, you say, well, what about this and what about this and doesn't don't, aren't we, shouldn't we just be for love? I am. I'm for the love of God that revealed the truth in Scripture. Now, now I, I know that this raises all kinds of issues, and I understand that. I don't want to chase that rabbit this morning. I want to be clear that, that, that the Scripture, regardless of what so many people might think and say, is very clear about this issue. There is great liberty within marriage between one man and one woman. But that is the narrow parameter that's revealed in the Word of God. And it's not been that way for the last 15 minutes. It's been that way since Moses got the law. It's been that way since Jesus has risen from the dead. It's been that way since the Spirit of God filled men to write Scripture. And so we have... 6,000 plus years of that being the rule. In the last 15 years or so, there's been this movement of people trying to take the Bible and write books and say things that, that how Christianity has viewed sexual immorality for the past 2,000 years. Hear me, 2,000 years. There's been consensus among the Christian church about what sexual immorality is. But there's a growing number of people that are taking the Bible and they're saying, oh, no, that's not what it really means. 
we've got fresh revelation. And just coincidentally, it lines up with my fleshly desires. All of us have our own brand of sexual sin that we're drawn to. I mean, it's as unique as the individuals who are in this room. However, it doesn't matter how we feel like we're wired. And it doesn't feel like we're wired. It doesn't matter if we're wired that way from birth. Hear me, that makes no difference whatsoever. Okay? I was wired from birth to be selfish and self-centered. Every time I got hungry, I cried and I screamed until somebody took care of my needs. Just had a grandbaby. Lo and behold, he's wired the same way. <laughs> I don't care that you haven't got sleep, mama. I'm hungry. Self-centered. You say, oh, it's just a baby. Yeah, but if you don't grow out of that, that kind of self-centeredness in this body ain't pretty. You say, well, I'm just wired this way. I'm wired. We're wired all kinds of ways that we have to come in line with the truth of the Scripture concerning. Amen. Well, tell me you're wired that way. What difference does that make? And so, so in, in this instance where something that's being spoken about is so clearly a sin in the Scripture, why would he highlight this particular one and not the litany of other things that are in the Scripture and called a sin? And I believe the central issue here is that it was pervasive, just like it is in our day. It was pervasive. It was pervasive outside the church, and I think that there was still among the Gentiles who were being saved, they hadn't grown beyond it yet. And they were still keeping parts of their old lifestyle that they hadn't jettisoned yet, they hadn't fully repented of yet, and they were bringing them into the life of the church. You think... If you wonder if that's true, go read 1 Corinthians. Oh, my goodness. To the point of strange forms of incest happening in the church. Maybe not in the building, but, you know, people are in the church. And they were just letting, winking at it. They weren't saying anything about it. They weren't being confronted about it. And so it was pervasive. Now, hear me. If you'd been raised a Jew in those days, that was a central teaching that you heard. So much so that it was one of those things that people got stoned for. It was serious. And if you came into a church where somebody was telling you that God was going to save you because of everything that Jesus did for you, and then you come into church and you see people who are so radically living against God's principles, it would cause you pause. And what James is saying here is we need to confront this. And it's like we're not adding things to salvation. We're not saying that you need Jesus plus your sexual purity in order to be saved. What he's saying is, listen, Gentiles, we're not going to labor you with the law even though that's somewhat offensive to these Jews that are with you. We're not going to label, labor you underneath the law, but you need to cut some slack to your Jewish brothers and don't flaunt sexual immorality in their face and expect them to be able to hear the gospel out of your mouth. Does that make sense? James is not adding a condition to salvation. He's rather saying, because you are saved, this is an obvious one that's a problem and we need to work on because the Jews are going to stop listening to us if we don't get this right. It's the same thing with the idea of meat offered to idols, non-kosher meats, things that have been strangled or have blood in them. This is a little bit different because Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians 8, that it's not a sin to eat meat offered to idols. That in itself is not sinful. So praise the Lord, have a BLT. The kosher laws don't apply anymore. But that was still an important central part of Jewish religion that would have been a stumbling block to any Jew that they tried to share the gospel with. 
And as a consequence of that, James is saying, so we should abstain from the sexual immorality. That's an obvious sin. Come on, guys. And then also abstain from meat offered to idols, things that have not been bled properly, things that are strangled, because there are Jews that we want to reach with the gospel that will be so radically offended by that that they won't be able to hear. Paul, when he talks about it in 1 Corinthians 8, calls it what has affectionately been termed the doctrine of the weaker brother. That basically says, you have a lot of liberty in Christ. A lot of liberty. However, don't use that freedom and that liberty to flaunt and eventually cause a stumbling block to someone else who might be weak in the faith. Now, and listen, that applies to us now. You say, I've got some liberty. I, can, I feel like I can do this and it doesn't offend God. Well, listen, offending God is not our only concern. Are we unnecessarily offending others? Are we making it hard for them to hear good news because of things that we do? Now, I had somebody years ago. I mean, somebody, it, it, was, it was very old, like, like way you know, older than me like 55, <laughs> he came to me and he said, I've been a part of this church. This is two churches ago, by the way, so it's not here. I've been a part of this church for so-and-so, and I've been a part of uh, the faith since I was 16 years old. And, and he laid his pedigree out for me, and he said, and what you did right there offends me. And Paul said that if it offends me, you're supposed to stop doing it. And I said, Okay. So you're admitting that you're the weaker brother. And he had this look that caused us like, I'm not, not. wait a minute. You just admitted that I'm doing something that offends you and you think Paul is telling me in 1 Corinthians 8 that I have to stop doing it for your sake. You've been saved for 30 years, pal. It's time to stop parting whiskers to take your bottle. So don't go misapplying that because it'll heat me up like a microwave. <laughs> but when you see someone that needs to hear good news, it is necessary for us where we can make sure that we're not creating unnecessarily st unnecessary stumbling blocks in their lives so that they might hear. And they might hear, come into the faith, be filled with the Spirit, and then they'll grow. James isn't adding conditions to salvation. I think what he's saying is don't be a stumbling block. You go back and reread this for yourself. I, I think that this is good truth that we all need to hear. That there aren't conditions that need to be added to salvation for it to be, for it to be legitimate. But I also think that anyone who's had a legitimate experience with grace and is growing in that and has a heart for people is going to have to watch how they live. Otherwise, the way you walk will drown out everything you have to say. And so praise God we got delivered from the law. There is just no doubt there's a moral code that we should live by. I think the entire Bible is replete with descriptions about how God designed us to live. And anyone who's been saved, I think they'll grow in that stuff. I think our consciences, once we're saved, are inspired for us to inspire us to live by design. But we need to make sure that we don't believe this for ourselves and we don't impose this on anybody else. Obedience to the commands is not what saves us. Furthermore, obedience to the commands is not what keeps us saved. There's no doubt that it does show that we are saved. It's a revelation of what's going on in our heart. And I also think that if you're rejecting the Christian life and you claim to be in Christ, 
that you're robbed of all basis for your assurance. I bet you live with all kinds of doubts about whether or not your salvation is real. But definitively, from this passage and so many others, it is by grace you have been saved. My salvation and your salvation is based solely on what God did for us through Christ, not what we do for him. And that's the end of the story. That's Bible truth. But we will, in our fallen flesh, probably struggle with moving back toward works-based thinking. It's subtle. In me it is. I'll do something and I'll feel like God's mad at me now. Like Jesus made God happy, but I made him mad. I'll, I'll misinterpret conviction as God's anger or wrath. God's scolding me. No. Conviction is God speaking to your heart and saying, you weren't designed for this. And if you keep doing this, it's going to be bad fruit because bad seed will grow into bad fruit. I'm not mad. My wrath Everything that you deserved for what you have done, are doing, and will do, wrath-wise, was poured out on Jesus on the cross. However, if you plant bad seed, it's still going to produce bad fruit. And so conviction is not God slapping you about the neck and shoulders just to make you feel bad. It's actually a course correction that once you realize how much he loves you, you should fall in love with. Because if I didn't get convicted, I would walk off a moral cliff. Because my flesh is crazy. <laughs> so getting convicted, I'm not saying it feels good, and I'm not saying, thank you, sir, may I have another. But it's actually an expression of his love for us. Think about it this way. When you fall under conviction, rather than thinking God's mad, think this way. God is so fully committed that he will never give up on me. Even when I'm stubborn and complacent, he will not give up on me. And he will keep contending with me over and over and over again until I start living in a way that brings the best to my life and the most glory for his. Oh, God, please don't give up on us. Good news. He won't. That's conviction. You might look at other people and think, they're not as much of a believer as I am because they don't do this. Or you might wake up one morning and do something that's out of character and think, I'm not as much a believer as I thought I was. All these things subtly fall into our thinking. And what they are is a Jesus plus something gospel. The truth of the good news is that God made a choice to love you. Knowing full well who you were, what you had done, as well as who you would become and what you would do, good or bad. And knowing everything there is to know about you, God made a choice to love you. And nothing influenced him to do that except himself, and nothing is going to change his mind. It's good news. Now, no doubt we all struggle to believe that the good news really could be this good. But anything less simply isn't the gospel. And if we walk in this truth, I know that myself walking in this truth, if it's taught me anything, it's that the carrot works better than the stick. I don't know if you've ever heard the analogy try to get a mule to move, you can use a stick or you can use a carrot. He loves the carrot, he hates the stick. What's going to inspire him to work? What's going to inspire him to do what he's supposed to do? What's going to inspire him to live like you want him to live? And I think of childhood, the stick worked a little bit. 
but it only worked when mama was looking. Am I right? The carrot works so much better. And by that, I mean that I have been more greatly inspired to obey the revealed commands of Scripture since I have become convinced of his unwavering love for me. I've been infinitely more inspired to live according to command once I was convinced of his unwavering love than I ever did when I thought if I messed up, he'd get mad at me. Paul said it so clearly in Romans 2, 4. That it's the kindness, the patience, the forbearance of God that brings people to repentance. The carrot always works better than the stick. Now to be clear, I think any growing believer should have a life that's growing in conformity to God's design. But that is not what saves us. And you may hear me very, very clearly say what I think God's design is. But I also pray that you can hear that that's not what saves you. That's what's going to make your life better. And that's what's going to bring most glory to God. Yes. And if you're saved, then I have to believe the Spirit of God is in you right now, inspiring you to that end. And I want you to know what that is. And our struggle with this comes out in various ways. Mistaking correct conviction and correction as rejection holding on to shame rather than clinging to grace. That's when you feel like you have to hide stuff rather than acknowledging that, oh, yeah, I did it and God's forgiven me for it. I'm grateful for his goodness. And it's very likely that we're going to have to live our whole lives fighting this battle. What I affectionately have turned to my own heart is leaning on the steering wheel of my soul because... I got an old truck, and last year I had to replace pretty much everything in the front end of it because you couldn't get it aligned. And so I had to live bearing down on it to the left because if I just took my hands off of it or didn't hold on to it tight, it would head straight into the ditch. The ditch in my life is works-based thinking. And I can't ever get that aligned, I don't think, on this side of heaven. And so I live leaning on the steering wheel of my soul by announcing good news over myself and to everybody who will listen as often as I can because I know you need to hear it, but hear me, y'all. I need to hear it because it's so easy to slip back in to works-based thinking. This occurred to me this week, one of the ways you might spot this in yourself. If you were to lead someone to Christ this week, what would be the first thing that you think they would need to hear about? What's the first lesson you really think they need to hear? You led someone to Christ, they've responded to the gospel, they're babies in the faith. What's the first thing they need to hear? Do they need like a 10-week in? You know, engulfing, all engulfing understanding of the gospel and how we are saved and how much God loves them and all that he did for them through Christ? Or do you immediately start with lifestyle modification? God loves you and God called you. You come and they say, okay, I'm going to repent and believe. Okay, now it's time for you to stop doing this and stop doing that and stop doing this, and stop doing this right here. And then you need to start doing this, and that, and this. There'll be another list tomorrow. (laughs) Babies in Christ. What would be your knee-jerk reaction? Don't say it out loud, but what would it be? Would you think, okay, they really need to hear the, the goodness of the gospel. They need to hear about everything that God did for them through Christ. They need to hear about how serious and significant it is, how life-changing it is. Or would you look at them and say, ah, okay, eh, you need to do this, ah. I 
I am convinced that the carrot works better than the stick. When people become enamored by the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the forbearance of God, that is the thing that leads us all to repentance. And I'm very grateful that God didn't ask me to change everything on day one. Stuff didn't stop becoming a sin, but I can honestly say that I did things for years with no sense of conviction, and then one day, oh, I knew, oh, I don't need to do this anymore. This is not right. And I'm grateful that he scattered that out now over 30, 40 years because if he'd have dumped all that on me in one moment, oh, my goodness. You ever had that moment where you just realized there was something not right about you that you were blind to? Wow, maybe, maybe I am a little hateful. I thought everybody else was just sensitive. Maybe it's not okay that I just say I'm hard, hardwired to be this way. Maybe, maybe the power of God's supposed to overwhelm that. Hmm. Listen, that transformational process of sanctification happens progressively over the course of a long haul for most of us. You say, Brian, are you saying we're supposed to wink at people's sin? No. But I need you to recognize that you're not the Holy Spirit. And you can point it out and point it out and point it out until you become affectionately known as a pointer. But you cannot change anyone. I don't have a single problem with anybody knowing what I believe, knowing why I believe it. And I would encourage anyone to live according to Scripture because I am totally convinced that that is the way. It is the way. It is the best way. If I get mad at you and I, 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 I treat you like you're second class or not as, not as classy as I am because I've made it past a struggle and you haven't, then what I'm actually doing without saying it is saying it's really Jesus and doing all the things that I think you should do. we got to be careful, friends. I led two young men to the Lord in years past that really illustrated this well. Both of them were very, very heavily into drugs. Both of them were dealing drugs. Uh, one of them, Trenton, Tennessee, a uh, young man was living with a much older woman at the time and, and, and selling cocaine out of his apartment. And I had an encounter with him, and I led him to the Lord. And he was radically saved. It was an amazing thing. And immediately, I didn't have to tell him what sin was. He said, you know, I need to stop doing this, don't I? I'm like... Well, it's not in line with the scripture. And so if you're saying you're convicted about it, then I think the Lord's telling you that it's time to go ahead and put that aside. So immediately he went home and he moved out from living with this woman. He, he flushed all his stash down the toilet. Went cold turkey from cocaine in a day. I know, right? When you hear stuff like that, it's like, hallelujah. That doesn't happen for everybody. I mean, God's working. And then he comes to church on his second Sunday, not knowing the dress code. And a sweet saint. And I say sweet in that sense that she was a bitter old hag. <laughs> Stood on the front steps, and as he walked in and said, you're going to come into this church with short pants on? And in his mind, it's the middle of summer. I mean, I've got pants on. Look down to here. You can see my knees. Listen, he had the skinniest, most pathetic legs you've ever seen in your life. There's zero chance anybody was going to lust after those legs. <laughs> but here's what happened. That was the first moment where he really realized, okay, so I've got to give up short pants, which you don't. I mean, be, I mean, modesty is not about pant length. It's about your heart. I mean, don't get crazy. But the first moment that he, he turned around, he left. He didn't come in. She kept him from going to church that day. He called me that afternoon. We talked, and I said, and then he came back the next week, and uh, between Sunday school, he wore pants. 
uh, full length ones, by the way. Came back the next week, and between Sunday school, he came to Sunday school. Between Sunday school and church, he walked out and he smoked a cigarette. Different woman came out and, and said, those things will send you to hell and make you smell like you've been there. And it took two or three weeks before he'd had enough. And what I saw radically work in his life totally regressed over the course of a few weeks. Now, I listen, I know God's sovereign over salvation. If God saved him, kids still saved. I get that. But I'm going to tell you, there were some saints that didn't do a thing to help him. You say, well, short pants of sin? No, they're not. But even if they were, that wasn't the right way. Another young man, once again, drug dealer. I don't know. I've just really not had that much of a success with drugs, you know, helping people get delivered from drugs over the course of my life. But I have led two drug dealers to the Lord. And the, the second one, he, 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 he was doing acid. I mean, all kinds of just debauch behavior and and, and he, he just, he laid it all down, except for cigarettes, and he didn't quit cussing right away. Stopped taking LSD by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yet he dropped a few words every now and then in the wrong company. And rather than letting the Spirit of God work that out in him, it's one thing to correct and say, you know, brother, that may be, you know, that's kind of offensive to people around. Let's be kind. It's like, no, he had people point fingers in his face. As if everything else he had let go didn't matter. What did it communicate? Well, it's Jesus plus everything else that all these finicky people think I need. We're some finicky folks, aren't we? Do you have some holy cows like that? Read William Eason's book years ago that said, holy cows make gourmet burgers. <laughs> A really cute title. The book was mediocre. But, but hear me. In your heart, do you really believe and it's Jesus plus nothing else. Now, if you've heard me say you've got license to do anything you want to do, you've been hearing what you wanted to hear this morning. I have not said that. But I am saying that it's the job of the Holy Spirit to work those things out in our lives. And we're not going to attach anything to salvation to make it real. If that's something you're struggling with, I pray you'll experience some freedom today. God's love for you is not based on how you act. God's love for you is based on who he is. And you can't change him. God's love for you will give you all the course correcting you need and contend with you. If you're going to communicate the gospel to people, you need to be sensitive about what is or isn't going to be a stumbling block to them. But you, you also need to make sure that you're presenting a Jesus plus nothing gospel. You say, but they need to be schooled. They need to be learned. I agree. They're not going to get that on day two. They're going to be a baby for a while. So they've been in the faith for 30 years and they're still doing it. Well, I'm going to question whether or not they had a legitimate work of grace in the first place before I question whether or not the Holy Spirit hadn't been working on them for 30 years. <laughs> Hear me, friends. Plus nothing. And if you need to hear it, I pray that you will. And if you need to live it, I pray that you will as well. Because we need to know this in here, and we need to make sure that we're not trying to Share a gospel that doesn't line up with that truth. Let's pray together. Lord, this issue has brought back so many memories for me as I've thought about life and the traditions that 
I once thought were so important. And the way that I have graded myself over the years on whether or not I was a good son or a bad son and whether or not you really could love me. And I'm grateful that even as I've preached this today, it's warmed my own heart and confirmed in my heart that I am loved not because of anything I've done to deserve it or disdain it, but because that's who you are. And you made a choice to love me, and you'll continue to make that choice, and I'm grateful. I pray that there's anyone else in this room today that needs to have their heart warmed from truth, that it would come for them. And even though our obedience doesn't dictate your care and concern for us, I pray that our conscience would be guided, that in due season you would cause the revelation of the Spirit, the testimony of the saints, to help us to be guided in what the Christian life looks like because the more I recognize how much you love, oh God, the more I want to live in a way that glorifies you and the more I trust that what you say to do and not do is really about my good. May our faith for these things increase. I want to thank you for these saints in Acts 15 that paved a way for us to be set free from a legalistic gospel. But Lord, would you do what's necessary to work in our own hearts so that we continue to be free from it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.